as you can imagine, this is a video I have been waiting to film for a long time. I am excited to finally get to talk about the finale of the Alone Frozen season. This is a big one. As you can imagine, there are definitely going to be some spoilers here, but we will save those for the end. The finale, known as episode eight in the standard show, and unfortunately episode nine on Amazon because they started with the Before the Freeze prequel, but this is the episode called The Bitter End, which I think is unfortunate because in my mind it was anything but bitter. Because there was such a big spread and when people came out on Alone Frozen, the final episode goes through a big span of days. So there's going to be a lot of my backstory to cover that you don't see on film, particularly those last 12 days, which were covered in about three minutes on the show, but took a long time and there was a lot going on. So I'm gonna be talking about a lot of the things that you're seeing in this episode and a lot of the things that you are not seeing. And also of course, some general survival. We start this episode with 17 days left. So over a third of the entire season getting covered in just this one episode. As you can imagine, there's too much to talk about to put this all in one review. So this is going to be part one of my two-part review of the finale of Alone Frozen. There's also going to be a lot more than I can talk about in themes in general, so I'm going to be putting out more videos specific to the items that I brought, how they did for me out there, and what I would recommend, the clothing that I brought out, the crafts that I did, and some of the other things that we don't see in detail but are lengthy enough to go ahead and cover in their own videos. So keep your eyes on this channel for some more of that Alone Frozen content. The episode starts with me crawling on hands and knees out my door, which was really just a small opening in the side of my shelter. Crawling out was absolutely terrible because it was such wet snow there. So every time I would crawl out, I would just get all of this wet snow all over me. It definitely was not a good way to go. So getting a better entrance was a high priority for me. Why am I still working on my shelter on day, what would that have been, 33, you might ask? Because that is just the way it is out there. There are so many tasks to get done all the time that you are constantly going back and forth between the highest priorities. What I would say is you're constantly putting out fires, right? Oh, I just injured myself. I have to deal with that before I do anything else. Okay, I got something on my trap line. I have got to deal with that before I do everything else. Oh my goodness, a big storm is coming and I need firewood stored up ahead of time. I have got to work on that. So that is why there are still a lot of shelter tasks I was hoping to do earlier, but it just wasn't possible. And keep in mind too, that when you are on the coast, the tides absolutely control your life. And in my case on Frozen, because I had just one small beach and the mussels were mostly covered with water, even at the lowest of tides, I had to make the best possible use of the one section that I had of very low tides. So I was basically spending almost every daylight hour either harvesting mussels or building mussel storage, what I called mussel farms on the beach. By this time in the season, I am no longer putting my mussels in pools on the rocks because those all froze solid at this point because they got covered only at the very highest of tides. They were mostly just exposed and temperatures got cold enough. That meant it was either frozen solid or slushy. So I was digging my hands into slushy seawater to harvest the mussel farms. That wasn't gonna work. Plus, when we would have bad storms, which as you can see was a lot out there, the waves would crash so hard, they would wash my muscles out. So that was a problem. So at this point I have shifted to building huge towers, kind of like muscle castles on the beach, lower down to where they are gonna be covered by the water for more hours a day. And that was key because it meant they were both more protected. They were underwater where the moving storms weren't going to be smashing them out. And then also it meant that they were not going to be freezing in the same way because they would be covered and then exposed, covered and then exposed as opposed to covered every once in a great while. So I was hauling huge rocks, building these towers, putting the muscles in there so that by the time we get to the last 15 days or so, I knew that I had enough muscle stored in those towers assuming nothing went wrong, no 
Storms took them out. No other creatures found those mussel farms and started exploiting them. And assuming the sea ice didn't come and freeze those underwater to where I couldn't get to them very easily. Also, every time I had to go down and get mussels from those, as I've talked about a bunch, I am having to crawl down some serious cliffs and haul those heavy mussels all the way back up. So the episode starts with me adding to my shelter and putting an entranceway. Now the entranceway was very important for a lot of different reasons. One is that I meant I could crouch but walk right through my doorway as opposed to crawl and get covered in snow. That was really huge. And then also having a tunnel entrance that was perpendicular to the shelter is really key because it breaks up the wind. And it also meant that it gave me additional covered storage. As you can see, by this time, we are getting heavy, wet snows all the time. So that means it's really rough to have to store your firewood outside of the shelter. So building that entrance way meant that I had, one, a better way for myself to get in, two, a place to put my camera equipment so that the camera case that I had wasn't taking up a ton of space in my very small shelter and wasn't out where it was exposed and getting sealed shut with ice regularly. So that was super key. And then also gave me room for storage of my firewood and also storage of mussels. So I would keep my crocheted bag, which of course I crocheted out of yarn from the world's biggest sweater in the entranceway as well. I also had a crocheted bag of sea urchins plus a big pile of seaweed for me to process and eat lived in that storage tunnel, which made my life in that shelter so much better. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the notifications bell if you wanna know when my videos come out, but I am doing my best these days to put them out on Monday, noon Pacific. That's when to look for my videos. Also, I really encourage you to join my Patreon team. I'm not able to answer all of the questions in the comments or engage with everyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but Patreon is where we're able to have longer conversations, more interactions, and it's a really awesome skills and nature connection focused community. It's been a real joy to create my Patreon team and I'd love for you to join us there. Day, what is it, 30? 334, as you see me doing this building, I knew that I had enough food to make it through. I knew I was gonna be okay, unless I really screwed up and injured myself. So that's why I mean super cautious every time I use that ax or saw, thinking about making it safer for me to go on the ice, everything I can do to manage risks and make accidents less likely to happen was super key. The next scene, we go to Michelle and we see her in her shelter. Now, of all the shelters on this season, I feel like Michelle's and mine were the most oriented towards long-term stay out there. And this episode is when we start to see one of the liabilities of Michelle's, which is that she doesn't have a chimney. What she has is just an open hole in her ceiling for her smoke to go out through. Now, that typically works okay in super calm weather, but when you have rushing wind, then that wind can easily get down into your shelter. And as she talks about, the smoke kind of swirls around and it doesn't easily go straight up. Now, I was very, very adamant about the importance of a chimney on my time on Frozen because I had a system similar to what Michelle has here on season six, and it was a major handicap for me, both one, too much smoke staying in the shelter, not getting out as we're seeing here. And then two, not being able to keep the shelter warm enough because all of your warm air goes up through that hole, right? Heat rises. So if we have a shelter designed around having the fire under the high point of the shelter, then most of that heat goes away rather than staying in your shelter. So a chimney means that you can really seal it and that all of those rocks of the chimney are absorbing and giving back that heat. We're gonna see this coming in later. When the smoke got really bad for both of us, Michelle had to keep that fire going because she just wasn't warm enough in her shelter without it. I was able to stay warm in my shelter, but letting that fire go out. So returning to Michelle and her shelter, it's a great shelter, but we are seeing the liability of that open smoke hole. Really, really sweet to have Michelle give me a shout out in the episode and talk about how she felt a really strong connection with me. That was so sweet. And I felt that with Michelle too. I went and visited her in Maine and we had a wonderful connection. So for it to be 
just the two of us still out there on this episode, I think was really deeply meaningful to both of us. And I even had brought some wool home from when I met Michelle in Maine and incorporated it into the felt booties that were the liner of the boots that I made to bring out there. So I brought Michelle with me and that special connection to my frozen season. And it was really magical. Here's where we hear Michelle talking about the difference between red meat and muscles and her saying, look, it's great to have muscles, but my body needs red meat. For me, having gone so hungry on season six, having muscles was amazing. So sure, I would have loved more variety and more other food, but having muscles was incredible. That said, yeah, 100%. It's true that my body responded really differently to having red meat than it did to the muscles as well. It really, really made a difference. And you can see that in both of us. We're like eating muscles, eating muscles. Okay, no, we're gonna be okay. But then we get meat, it is just, ah, oh, it is amazing. It is this deep, visceral, yes, feeling. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference between meat and seafood like mussels, clams, and other shellfish. So one thing is that obviously in looking at it, the clams and mussels, they are not bright red. So that means they are lacking a lot of the minerals that we get from red meat, specifically iron. So animals like mammals and birds, they're using hemoglobin to transport oxygen around their bodies rather than not needing that because they're getting oxygen through the dissolved oxygen in seawater. That red meat just really feeds those parts of ourself. Also, mussels and clams are very low in fat, so we're not getting very much of that. This is a great time to point out, both Michelle and I brought pemmican on this season. I think we are the only ones who did so. So we both have a little fat, which is making that seafood and that lean meat that we're catching more digestible. Very few people tend to bring rations as one of their items on alone, but I am a huge advocate of it not because of just the calories it brings, but how it helps our bodies make use of all of the rest of the calories that we are able to bring in. Another important thing is that most people are less likely to react to meat than they are to seafood. Seafood is a common allergen, and it is something that people can develop more and more allergies of over time. And we saw that with Callie. She didn't have a problem with muscles early on, but it built and built in her system and she became totally intolerant of them eventually. That is another reason why meat over seafood, it's a little bit safer way to go because you're less likely to build a reactivity to it. Neither of us decided that we hated shellfish after relying on them so fully. We both love them more than ever. So we're lucky that we had the physiology to handle them well, but we both really felt the difference between that red meat and all of that seafood. Then we see Michelle going out to check her trap line, disappointed because she's not seen squirrels. So there's nothing in her trap line. And then she sees something and it takes her a minute to register that it's a grouse. How amazing is that? Especially in deep snow like that, where grouse are not moving as quickly. Now, I am so with Michelle as she's talking about how there's just nothing out there. All of that snow, fresh snow all the time, we are able to see the movements of the animal and the vast majority of the time, there are no tracks. It's just such a sparse landscape. There's very little in it. So it was a big deal for her to see those grouse. I have to tell you, I saw exactly two grouse in all of my time out there, a mated pair the same day, high up in a tree. I shot at them a couple times, I missed. It was the same kind of conditions like you are seeing a lot in here and on season nine where every single shot you take is a lost arrow. So you just constantly have to do this you know, how, how much is it worth it to get a grouse knowing how likely I am to lose arrows here? Isn't it better to wait until I have a better shot, not up in a tree that is backed by thick forest where I can't find this, but when they're on the ground sometimes so I can find the arrow, like happened to Michelle. For me, I never got that shot. I never saw them again. I would have done better to empty my whole quiver, but there's no way to know that. And you're always balancing the odds and trying to do what seems best in that situation. So I was so thrilled to see Michelle have that grouse fairly quick and her very first shot was a good shot. Now I'm thinking that because it was pretty close, 
her arrow didn't go all the way through it. So I think she must not have pulled her bow back all the way because at that range with a minimum 45 pound bow, I'm kind of surprised the arrow didn't go all the way through it. I'm thinking that it's because she actually had a blunt on it. So an arrow that wasn't designed to go all the way through, but to stun the grouse. So it was either that, either it was the type of arrowhead that she had on there, or it was that she hadn't actually fully drawn her bow. Either way, she gets that arrow into the grouse such that it is staying in the grouse and hindering its ability to get away. She was able to catch up to it, get a second shot into it that was absolutely a killing shot and so beautiful to see her get that grouse. Now, I know that it can be hard to see an animal's reaction after it's killed. This episode had a couple of them. Here's the thing. I know it's hard to see, but this is the reality. We have a lot of things built into our language around the reality of some of these animals dying, right? The phrase, like a chicken running around with its head cut off, we use that in common speech, but it's actually true. Birds will have a strong reflex reaction. I apologize for how hard it is for some folks to watch, but it's a thing that happens with some frequency. I raised meat rabbits for years and some rabbits would scream when you grabbed them. The reality is that most creatures have some kind of nervous system response to death where their muscles flex for a while, even if they are absolutely dead, even if they no longer have a head, even if they have an arrow through their heart or lungs, it is a thing that happens. And it's hard to watch because most of us are so removed from death in our lives. We buy our meat from the store without ever knowing the animal as a living creature. So there are a lot of people who think nothing of buying meat from the store who are really disturbed by seeing an actual animal actually die. But that is the reality of life. Life takes life. Even if you are vegetarian or vegan, don't think that you have less impact. Do you know how many mice and voles and other creatures are cut to pieces when a field of wheat is harvested? A lot. Agriculture is far more damaging to animals and living things as a general rule than hunting in wild places are, where at least those animals had their natural habitat and lived a good life. So I understand that it's hard to see, but I think it's important to keep in mind the bigger picture and that when we buy meat from the store, all we're doing is pushing our impacts further away where it's harder for us to see them, not eliminating, or in some cases, not even dramatically lessening our impact. The next scene is me working on my door. Now my tunnel entrance was great, but the ferocity of those storms meant I absolutely had to have a door. And the whole point of that entrance was so that I didn't have to crawl out under. So making a door was super key. And that was my original intention when I hauled that driftwood, that lumber that you see me hauling up over my shoulder in a huge piece in one of the earlier episodes. That's why I brought it up there because having dimensional lumber is an amazing resource. And it was an incredible effort to haul it up hundreds of feet of cliffs to that site. But here is where it pays out for me. Building that door was a serious process. It was a lot of work. First, I had to pry the boards apart so I would use my ax to wedge it in and then pry, being careful and trying not to abuse my ax. So not actually touching the nails with the tip of my ax, but just using the ax as a wedge and then putting other wood in there to drive it open and pry with. It was a huge effort. And then I was very careful to save all of the nails. Most of them were rusted through and very short. Used the back of my ax to straighten them, the file on my Leatherman to work them down into sharp points and then hammered them back in. So I had very small nails. So I had to be very conscientious and I actually had to drill a little bit of a hole in for those nails so that they would go through far enough to grip the opposite piece of wood. It was a very complicated construction project. I actually made my door in the same style that we saw Adam building his door on season nine, which was uprights that were vertical pieces of wood with a cross piece on top a cross piece on bottom, and then a diagonal piece that 
joined all of those pieces together. And that diagonal piece gives pieces stability. If you just have all right angles, then the whole thing can shimmy around. This is the standard way that you would build an old timey barn door or house door with just dimensional lumber. I also used a bit of snare wire to lash it all together. So I didn't have a hinge, but I could just move it back and forth, but having a solid door and something that was easy to move as opposed to just a handful of boughs was amazing. When I go out to check my trap line this next scene, I am saying, Labrador, if you really love me, this is the way you can show me. You can sing me your love song by bringing me game in my trap line today. So I wanna talk a little bit about this and my process with coming to love Labrador because I did not fall instantly in love with it like I had in the Arctic. And that was really hard for me. It's part of why my first week was so hard and I was so sad. I really wanted to have that same sense of love and deep connection and feeling like a part of the landscape right away. And I didn't. And at some point I realized that that was me trying to put all of my expectations from what I experienced in the Arctic onto this place, Labrador, which was a completely different place. And it wasn't fair of me to have those same expectations. So at that point I decided, look, I'm not going to go into this with a clear idea of what loving and being loved by a landscape looks like. I'm going to allow Labrador to sing its own love song to me. And that was a slow process, right? So it was a while to come to really love and appreciate Labrador because as you can see from this season and how fast it's taking people out, it was brutally hard out there. I didn't think anything could be harder than the Arctic, but it absolutely was. It took a while to reorient and come to have a different experience and lesser expectations of it. So at this point, I'm like, okay, I am in it. I feel the love of Labrador. And here's one thing that would really let me know you love me. I had been getting a semi steady supply of rabbits between a couple of squirrels, the ones whose intestines I'm using to fish with in this episode, a handful of rabbits, that fox. I'd been having game a lot less than the Arctic, but spread out. And you can actually see me in one of these scenes coming back after checking my trap line. I think I'm hauling something and you can actually see a couple of white legs sticking out the neck hole of my jacket. Obviously that was a hair from my trap line. So they were coming in, you're not seeing all of them, but I definitely went through a long period of not having them. So what was going on with that rabbit that was alive in my trap line? This was a big deal for me out there. What had happened is that I was wanting to bring some different types of snare wire with me. So some copper, some brass, some stainless steel. And then I brought narrow gauge wire that was 22 gauge and thicker gauge wire that was 20 gauge. Those were the only gauges we were allowed. So I was bringing some of each. I was having a hard time finding the 22 gauge wire. So I ended up going with some craft wire without realizing that the craft wire was anti-tarnish, which meant it had a special treatment. And that meant that it wasn't soft and it didn't just squish down when it was under pressure, it bounced back. So I used this wire that had some bounce back. And the way I discovered that was a few days before this, I went out to my trap line and like I had that day, there was a rabbit that was caught, but not dead. And it actually had a noose around its neck. And as I got close, it did the same thing. You're seeing this rabbit do, running and then reaching the end of the snare wire. And I stopped and I thought, oh no, what do I do? This rabbit is caught, but for some reason that wire isn't cinching around its neck, so it's alive. So I decided to creep slowly up on it so that I could grab it. Well, when I got close to it, it was so freaked out that it ran harder against the wire and it broke free with that noose still around its neck, which was horrible. So at that point I realized why it had happened and that it was that snare wire that was bouncy. And so I went around and I took out all of the snares that I could remember having done with that wire. I forgot the one that this rabbit is caught in. So what had happened was that it had pushed through the snare and the snare wire being bouncy had opened up wide enough for it to get its front legs through. But when it got to its hips, that then the wire couldn't give enough for its hips to get through because they're the biggest part of its body. When I saw that it was caught, like the other one was caught, I didn't try to creep up on it because I was afraid that it would do the same thing and break free. So I ran and I tackled it. So it was underneath my body. That is when it was screaming, not when I hit it with my ax, not when I 
twisted its neck, but when I was on top of it with it pinned underneath me, it was really freaked out. I really needed that food. So I had to grab it from underneath me and whack it on the back of the head with my ax, thus the blood on the snow. And then to make absolutely sure, I also broke its neck with my hands. All I had running was my GoPro, so you can kind of see the camera going into the snow and then me talking about how intense that was. This was such a good example of the tough love of Labrador. I said, if you love me, Labrador, bring me a rabbit. And it did, but it was not a dead frozen rabbit there. It was a live rabbit that I had to figure out how to dispatch efficiently, quickly, humanely, and without question, right? So tough love. I will absolutely give to you, says Labrador, but you have to do your part and it is not going to be easy. There's still so much left to talk about on this episode because it covers so many potent topics. So I'm going to do the rest of it in part two.